Good afternoon and welcome to the Daily Journal's Capital View webcast where we talk about state politics each week with Daily Journal Capital Bureau Chief Bobby Harrison. I'm Chris Kiefer, Managing Editor for Multimedia here at the Daily Journal. And uh, I guess we will get started today. Um, Bobby, you know, we've talked a little bit. Or we've talked a lot, you know, the, the U.S. Senate election and, um, you know, f- at first when Roger Wicker's seat was up and then kind of what would happen, um, you know, there was some you know, assumption that it was going to grow that, you know, uh, when, as soon as Stad Cocker announced he was going to drop out and you had two Senate, uh, seats open or, or two up for election, I should say, um, that, that the intrigue was going to grow and, and sure enough it has, um, I guess maybe we can start out talking Bobby. you had a column last week I thought was interesting that just looked at maybe how rare it is for Mississippi to be replacing a retiring Senator and, and kind of how long the longevity, I guess, senators had in Mississippi, um, Tell us about that. And, and and by the way, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Chris. I, thought, I was brought here under false circumstances. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about basketball, NCAA tournaments. <laughs> That's the only thing I've been paying attention to. Hey, how is your, how, how, how your bracket doing? And, and you I don't know. I, I stopped doing brackets a long time ago. I just enjoy the, enjoy the basketball games and, and don't do brackets. Uh, Once I lost my third Final Four team yesterday on the opening weekend, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm done with it. Who was that, North Carolina? North, whichever one was first, North Carolina and Michigan State, and that had already lost Virginia on on the opening okay. opening round. Yeah. So not yeah. good. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. It's back to the the, the the Senate, you know, Senate elections. You know, it, it's a big deal in Mississippi when there's a Senate vacancy because, as I point out in my column, you know, when I was born, uh, and that was a long time ago, Chris. There were, uh, you know, the two senators were. Uh, John Eastland and John uh, James Eastland and John Stennis, and they'd already been there for you know for multiple terms by the time I, I came along, and they were the U.S. senators while I was growing up, and you know in uh, in late '70s, Senator Stennis retired, and Thad Cochran replaced him, and then the late '80s, uh, 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 no, I was pardon, uh, late '70s, uh, Senator Eastland retired, and Thad Cochran replaced him, and then late '80s, uh, uh, John Stennis retired, and uh, and uh, that uh, Trent Lott replaced him, and they were senators for a long time. And now we have, uh, you know, uh, Thad Cochran and Roger Wicker. So, you know, those are the U.S. senators in my lifetime. We're in the, we're about to see a Senator Cochran announcing he's going to retire on April first. We're about to see another uh, sea change in the U.S. Senate as it uh, as it relates to Mississippi. Because we know he'll he'll be replaced. Uh, and and then of course uh, Roger Wicker, Republican from Tupelo, is up for re-election uh, this year. At the same time, and most observers believe he'll uh, cr- uh, cruise to re-election, especially now that uh, his chief Republican opponent, uh, Chris McDaniel, has announced he's not going to run against Wicker, but instead he plans to challenge for the open Thad Cochran seat. So there's just all sorts of intrigue going on right now. Who else is going to enter that race? Uh, Mike Espy, you know, who is a uh, First African American elected to Congress back in the from Mississippi back in the eighties. He's already announced he's going to run. Now we're waiting to see who uh, uh, Governor Bryant's going to appoint to that post in the interim basis. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and you know, Governor Bryant's indicated that he's probably going to make that uh, announcement uh, relatively soon. So probably before the end of this month, we're going to know who the interim senator replaced uh, Dad Cochran is. And then you know, in November there'll be a special election, where presumably uh, that interim. Uh, uh, appointment that uh, Governor Bryant makes, as well as Chris McDaniel and uh, uh, Mike Espy, and perhaps someone, you know, maybe even some more candidates be on the election ballot. At the same time, Roger Wicker is on the election ballot for re-election. So, that, you know, a lot of eyes will be on Mississippi this, this year, since the uh, Republicans and Democrats are battling for control of the Senate, and we're going we're gonna to have two elections here in Mississippi. So it'll be a, it'll be a, lot, of, a lot of people watching. Yeah, and, and you had referenced it, but I wanted to start talking about the, the biggest news related to all this from last week was the announcement by, by Chris McDaniel that he was um, no longer going to be running in the Roger Wicker race and that he was instead going to jump into the, the, the race for the open seat, that the, the one that's currently held by Thad Cochran. Um, again, you kind of referenced this, but I mean, I, I guess that completely changes um, – the dynamics of everything. I mean, I guess the Wicker race was, was shaping up to be interesting, you know, starting with that one first, um, just not, you know, be looking at the appeal that McDaniel had in his previous election and then going up against a well-financed incumbent. Um, now that race, I would guess first off becomes a lot less interesting, um, without McDaniel's presence. Is that right? 
Right, right. You know, uh, you know, a lot of people were expecting a tough primary with, uh, you know, Chris McDaniel, you know, came, you know, within a few hundred, or maybe maybe a thousand votes, maybe not even a thousand, but just a few hundred votes of defeating uh, Thad Cochran in 2014 when Thad Cochran was running for re-election. Uh, you know, he, uh, uh, Chris McDaniel, you know, he's a state senator from Ellisville down in, you know, Jones County. He came within uh, a few hundred votes of beating uh, Thad Cochran in 2014. And, uh, you know, most believed that he would run a strong race against Wicker in the primary. But uh, he, had already, he, had, he had challenged to run against Wicker. You know, they were already sort of going back and forth with each other. Wicker's done a lot of campaign advertising already. Uh, uh uh, critical of, mm-hmm. of McDaniel, but uh, last week uh, McDaniel announced that he was not going to run against Wicker, but instead was going to enter the race to uh, uh, for the open uh, Thad Cochran seat. And you know, so that's where the real intrigue going to be. You know, I can't stress how important it is uh, and how interesting it's going to be to see who the governor appoints to that position uh, to run against McDaniel. Uh, you know, McDaniel is a conservative Republican, but he's kind of at odds to a certain extent with the Republican establishment, if you will. So uh, he's running against the already running against the Washington Republicans, uh, Washington D.C. Republicans. Uh, you know, uh, against uh, Senate U.S. Senate Major- Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, saying that he's having undue influence over who the governor appoints. The governor comes back and says you know, he's making this appointment on his own and he's not having any undue influence put on him by Mitch McConnell or anyone else. So you know, it, it uh, you know. As I said, I, all eyes are on Mississippi and what Governor Bryant does in the next a week or two. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. You talked about um, McDaniel maybe being some at odds, uh, or or not not just maybe, but at, at McDaniel appearing to be at odds with the Republican establishment in Mississippi. One of the interesting um, behind the scenes things, I guess, from last week was um, maybe the apparent rift, uh, war of words, I guess, between. Uh, Governor Bryant, who is, um, you know, very popular uh, Republican, you know, in Republican circles, and um, and Chris McDaniel, and and maybe part of that, McDaniel ha- had asked, or had maybe his supporters had asked Bryant to name McDaniel into that seat, and and, and Bryant was pretty clear he wasn't going to do that, but but there was even a little bit more subcontext, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, I I don't know if it was uh, behind the. I think you might have referenced behind the scenes. I mean, the governor, Governor Bryant's uh, original quote when uh, Chris McDaniel entered the race, uh, said he was announced he was entering the race was was not. Uh, there, there is there is no uh, uh, there is no pretense there. It was clear how uh, Governor Bryant felt about that. I don't know if you have the quote. I don't have the exact quote uh, there in front of me, but it was such to the, yeah <clears throat> something to the extent that you know Chris McDaniel. Uh, it, uh, was being up, you know. He was. It was disappointing. He was. He was a, you know, a, a bright young had a, appeared to have a bright future, but now he just turned out to be a opportunistic politician. So it was a tough quote from uh, Governor Bryant, uh, uh, aimed at someone who at one time was it would have to have been viewed as a political ally, ally of uh, of Governor Bryant, and is even Governor Bryant's campaign uh, chairman in Jones County, and when he ran for lieutenant governor the first time back in a. Uh, 2007 so they go way back but uh but uh governor bryant's made it clear he's not going to appoint chris mcdaniel and uh and 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 is disappointed at mcdaniel for getting in the race uh you know presumably challenging whomever he appoints to that position yeah that, that quote um i've got it right here bryant said this this is of speaking of mcdaniel switching from one race to the other this opportunistic behavior is a sad commentary for a young man who once had great potential. Um, Bobby, it's interesting on that. I, I saw, I don't remember where I saw it on, on Twitter, maybe a poll, something, someone had done a poll that said um, the only person in Republican Mississippi that could definitively defeat McDaniel in a statewide election is Phil Bryant. Uh, and just seeing that, I thought also kind of added to, to some of that dynamic and, and also I uh, believe maybe it was in your story about the announcement or um, when McDaniel officially held the press conference that despite, the, again, this war of words going on, he was um, he was still pra- he was praising the job that Brian had done as, as governor and, and maybe realizing he still needs to keep some Brian supporters on his side. I mean, um, yeah, talk yeah. That dynamic a little bit. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, Brian uh, has always been, um, you know, very popular with the uh, the Tea Party element of the Republican Party, which is, you know, which is also McDaniel's base. And you referenced that poll, Chris. I mean, I, I hear, you know, different people give different perspectives. I'm, mm-hmm. So I'm not sure 
what the right answer is. I guess we'll find out soon about how strong McDaniel is now. You know, he, you know, like I said, he, he, he for all practical purposes, you know, literally won the Republican primary in 2014 against, you know, Thad Cochran, who is, you know, is a bona fide political icon in Mississippi. And, but some people felt in, in that race and his, uh, his uh, actions after the race when he wouldn't, you know, challenge the re- outcome and, you know, pursued legal recourse that some people he, believe he burned a lot of bridges at that time. Other people, you know, say that, you know, that they feel that he was a legitimate winner in that race and feel that uh, there was things that happened that uh, shouldn't have happened that kept him from winning that race. And so they view, you know, that, that you know, they view Chris McDaniel as sort of the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the rightful uh, heir to that seat, if uh, if you will. Uh, but so it's, it's going to be, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I, I hear both sides of that, so I'm not sure how strong McDaniel is, but like I said, we're going to, you know, we're going to find out in the coming months. What, what seems to be the, uh, I guess, the attitude, the response of people to him switching elections? Um, I mean, we, we read the quote from Ryan where he called it opportunist, opportunistic. Is he getting a lot of criticism for having done that? Do people just look at it as a decision not to go up against an incumbent? And maybe also what reasons did McDaniel give for why he switched from one to the other? Well, I mean, one reason he gives, I mean, you know, he, there was a lot of hard feelings after the, you know, Co- Cochran race in 2014. If you remember, Chris, what happened is that he won the, you know, he had the most votes in the first runoff mm-hmm. uh, in the first, you know, Republican primary, but he just fell just short a couple of percent a couple of tenths of percentage point short of, you know, winning the majority. So there was a runoff between him and Cochran and the runoff, uh, you know, there was a, appeared to be people who, uh, of course, Mississippi is, we, you know, you can, you know, uh, the, the people who didn't vote in that first primary, whether they normally vote Republican or, or Democrat could, could, uh, could vote in that second primary. And there's some who, you know, McDaniel's forces believe there's, uh, there were people who normally vote Democrat who came out to vote for Cochran and against McDaniel. And they just, you know, which is perfectly legal to do in Mississippi, but they just see that as an unfair action. And, and you know, they feel that uh, uh, McDaniel was, was, was uh, the, the, the election was, was stolen from him in that sense, even though as I, I stress again, that, you know, who, you know, whoever didn't vote in the first primary had every right, on Mississippi law to vote in the second primary. So, so those, uh, those arguments from McDaniel, McDaniel people really don't hold, hold water, but that's what many of them believe. Uh, so, uh, and, and so, I mean, I think with his base and those people believe that way, you know, the fact he switched elections, they don't, you know, they don't see that as a, as a big deal. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, that when, you know, when the campaign actually begins that some people will try to use that against them. I mean, I, but I don't think it's going to, you know, have a, a lasting negative impact on his. I don't think if he, whether he wins or loses, will will hinge on the fact that you know he he switched uh, races early on. I mean, after all, the qualifying deadline to run against Wicker was March first, and uh, Senator Cochran didn't announce his retirement until after you know that March first date. So mm-hmm. so you know he so he you know. As, as I said, when those people came out of voting that second primary, who might normally vote Democrat, that was legal. What, what Senator McDaniel's doing right now is also legal. So, sure. So, yeah. Sure. Going back to the issue of Brian's appointment, it, it, he's been pretty tight lipped about what might happen, other than saying he's not going to appoint himself and, and apparently saying now that he's not going to appoint um, McDaniel. Um, any further indication on, um, uh, you mentioned the timing that it may be soon. Uh, is there any further feeling on, on what might happen? Oh, uh, there's all sorts of rumors going around. You know, there's, uh, you know, you know, a lot of people believe Tate Reeves, lieutenant governor, is the front runner. You know, but there's people who say he's not interested in, in you know, taking his young family to Washington D.C. that he wants to run, and uh, next year for governor instead. Uh, so, but uh, you know, if it's not him, you know, here you here's Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman, uh, Ag Secretary Cindy Hyde Smith, Speaker Philip Gunn has been discussed. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, so there. I mean, there's all sorts of rumors right now going on. You know, there's still people who are convinced, even though Governor Bryant said he wouldn't, that in the end, Governor Bryant's going to appoint himself or either resign and have Tate, you know, Tate Reeves become governor, then appoint him. But you know, but he, he he's you know he has said that he he's not going to do that. But as you said, there's some people believe the only Republican who who, who can definitively 
definitively beat uh, Chris McDaniel is Governor Bryant. So, but so we'll see. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And, and on, on, I guess whoever he appoints, um, you know, if, assuming it looks like it'll be someone who holds another office, you know, there'll be a lot more dominoes that that fall from that, and and, and other people moving into elections. Um, one of which you wrote about this weekend, which is. Uh, if it were to be Tate Reeves, the lieutenant governor, and then, you know, I guess there's some question of what would happen then to his office. And, and it's not exactly clear how the next lieutenant governor or presiding officer of the senator, I should say, would be named. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, there was a lot of chatter about that last week or some chatter. Uh, you know, uh, there's a state law that says, you know, if there's a, a vacancy in a statewide office that the governor fills that vacancy. So, I mean, I think everyone agrees, say, if he appointed Delbert Hoseman Secretary of State, that he would, uh, the Governor Brown would also not only appoint Delbert Hoseman to the Senate, but would appoint the next Secretary of State. That's after all, so how, uh, after all, how Governor Bryant's sort of statewide political career began when uh, the Office of Audit, Auditor became open in 1996 uh, 97. Uh, he was appointed out of office by uh, then Governor uh, Kurt Fordyce. So, but I mean, but there's a, you know, the lieutenant governor is a statewide elected office, but if you look at the constitutional language, which would trump state law, there seems to be a strong argument that this, the, the, the Senate president pro tem would just ascend into the office and handle the duties of lieutenant governor if that office becomes vacant. The, you know, the pro tem is, is, is a constitutional, the Senate president pro tem is a constitutional office. And it, you know, there's even language in the Constitution that says if the if if the office of lieutenant governor becomes uh, uh, if the office the lieutenant governor can't fulfill his duties for whatever reason, that the pro tem should step into the, and perform those duties. So you know, the pro tem is elected by the 52 members of the Senate, and you know, the current pro tem is Terry Burton, a Republican from Newton. So uh, so I mean, I think there's a, a a fairly strong argument that the pro tem would become the the would, would act as lieutenant governor. And there's also perhaps just as important, you know, this did happen once before. And then in, in, uh, in, in this, in the 60s, uh, Carol Garton, uh, uh, lieutenant governor from Jones County died in office. And at that time, the pro tem uh, Yarborough, uh, and I forget his first name. I'm sorry, I'm going blank. He's from, was a senator from uh, Marshall County. Mm -hmm. He was a pro tem and he actually served as, he was listed as the acting lieutenant governor. So, uh, so I think there's a, 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 a couple of strong cases to be made that the pro tem would become the, would, would serve in the function, would fulfill the functions of the lieutenant governor until the next election in 2019. But, you know, if, you know, be, uh, there's, you know, if somebody, you know, if this is, you know, like so many things, it could actually end up in court where the courts would have the final say on how the uh, lines of succession would occur. Are there other duties, Bobby, uh, of the lieutenant governor? Uh, I mean, your story mentioned, of course, th there's the executive function just in that you're, you're uh, in the line of secession if something were to happen to the governor. But beyond that, are, are there other du any duties of the lieutenant governor besides what he does with the Senate, presiding over the Senate, uh, selecting committees, deciding which bills go to committee and, and so forth, which are all kind no, of basically... Well, he, I mean, he is a presiding officer of the Senate, and, you know, constitutionally... Uh, his duties are to preside over the Senate and also to serve as the next in line of, of gubernatorial secession. But his real duties, his real powers come from the powers that this, the members of the Senate give him. That you know, the members of the Senate and their Senate rules, which they adopt every four years, give him the authority to uh, make committee assignments, uh, uh, direct bills to committees. Which you know, in the legislative process, those are huge responsibilities and gives and, and, and responsibilities that give him huge power in the legislative process. So that makes you know that's what makes Lieutenant Governor one of the most powerful offices in the state. It's not his constitutional duties; it's the duties that the that the Senate give the duties that the Senate gives him through the, through their rules. And you know, back in the uh, late uh, early '90s or late '80s, you know, it was uh, they were. You know, those duties, there was a court challenge saying that, you know, because of his executive functions, he shouldn't have those duties in the uh, legislative branch. But at the time, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, state Supreme Court ruled that, you know, that he could have those duties that sort of made him sort of a super legislator, if you will. And uh, so, and, and, and that's another reason that, you know, a lot of people believe that the, that the uh, office of, that if the lieutenant governor's office became vacant, that it would be filled by the pro tem, 
because it, you know, it just doesn't, you know, because the separation of powers issues, it, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for the governor to be appointing members of the legislative branch mm -hmm. uh, uh, when there's a vacancy. So, so, uh, so we'll, uh, so, so, you know, but the lieutenant governor is, a, is you know, a strong office. Uh, uh, Tate Reeves has, has made it a, a particularly strong office for the past uh, six years or so. You know, and he, you know, he'll be term limited at, at you know, at, uh, to, you know, he's got this rest of this year and next year. Then, you know, he, so he got that much time left as lieutenant governor. And most people assume that he will run for the governor at, at that point. But unless, of course, mm -hmm. he decides and the governor makes the offer and he decides to take it to go to Washington as a as Mississippi's next United States senator. Sure. And, and again, we mentioned the dominoes. I mean, there, there, there's been talk for, um, you know, for several years uh, that, that Tate Reeves was the presumptive um, Republican front runner uh, for governor in, in 2019. And, and were he to go to Washington, you know, that there's another, I guess, domino that would be shaken up is, you know, what, what would happen in that race? And, yeah. And, and who else? You assume Deborah Hoseman would right. run. Assume to run for a lieutenant governor right now would run for governor if that occurred. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're jumping way ahead. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Which, of course, we That's have. What yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> Bobby, staying on the topic of, of the legislature now, um, we're, we're getting close to the end of the session, I guess. It's, it's a little bit less than two weeks to go now. Uh, w what's kind of on tap as, as this thing starts to wrap up? Well, you know, the, you know, there uh, everything that's going to happen now, uh, just about, you know, 95 percent of what happens from here on out is going to be done. You know, real work is going to be done. Conference committee. You know, three House members, three Senate members trying to hammer out, you know, differences on legislation, differences on the budget, differences on uh, on bond bills, revenue bills, transportation bills. So so there's, you know, it's kind of like the iceberg now. You know, most of what you see is going to be below water. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, it's it's uh, there's still a lot of work to do, especially in terms of transportation. If they're going to get a transportation uh, bill out of this session, which I know most of the House and Senate won't members want to, you know, they, they, you know, there's a there's a sort of a vast difference between what the House passed and what the Senate has Senate passed. So, you know, they're, they're going to come up to a meeting of the minds on that uh, in the next uh, several days. I think they have until Saturday night to reach an agreement on that, as well as the budget and, uh, and other revenue bills as well. One one of the uh, issues as they go through the budget that you've written about recently, there, there's this interesting piece of uh, what could happen with the education budget, specifically um, early in the process, the House had agreed to add eight million dollars to what education got last year. That, of course, at the time was part of the idea to change the new um, school funding formula um, that never happened. And so I guess the question now, Bobby, is, is whether that eight million dollars will still remain for education. Yeah, I mean, in a, you know, a two billion dollar budget, a two billion plus dollar budget, you know, eight million doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, for you know, for, for local school districts that that's been level funded or even cut over the past few years, you know, an additional eight million dollars split among those school districts, you know, could you know could have some impact. So we'll see, you know, and the argument of some educators is if the eight hundred million dollars was was available for a new funding formula, why is it not available for the yellow funding formula? So that'll be part of those uh, behind the scenes negotiations that I were I, I was talking about that you know they have until uh, Saturday night to reach an agreement on, and then they'll come in Sunday and actually start passing those bills. Okay. I guess, and so I guess, then the counter argument, or the from reading your story, story, it sounds like it's the Senate that that maybe is more opposed to keeping the money in. That their argument is that 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 money was was there with the design of um, making sure that districts wouldn't be held harmless, for, you know, wouldn't lose money going from one formula to the other, and in a tight budget year, they would maybe spend that money elsewhere. Is that right? Yeah, you know, and it, you know, I don't know if my story made this clear, Chris, but it's important to note that the. Eight million dollars was never in the Senate proposal. You know, the Senate okay. leadership wanted to pass the new funding formula bill, but it was never in their proposal to. Uh, uh, to uh, so I don't know if, the, if they had passed the funding formula, whether they would have you know, incorporated it into that, their proposal. But you know, it, it was it was it was originally in the House proposal, but never was in the Senate proposal. Got it. Another issue, um, Bobby, that that you wrote about that happened last year, uh, last week. I'm sorry, is a cigarette tax bill. Or a proposal, you know, that would that would have raised a cigarette tax um, was designed maybe for some health benefits. Also, would would have meant more money for the state coffers. Uh, that died last week um, because the bill wasn't brought up. Um, 
tell us about that. And is there a chance? It seems like maybe we talked on last week's program that maybe that could come back up through some of these conferences. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what uh, House Ways and Means Chair Jeff, uh, Jeff Smith said, uh, that there were some bills that that language could be incorporated into a in conference. I don't know if there's actually a chance of that. And, you know, and I'm, you know, it, you know, that's always a, sort of a, uh, you know, sort of high level uh, legislating to know, you know, what bills you can amend to do what. So I mean, that may be above my pay grade. But uh, Jeff Smith seemed to think there was a couple of bills that could be uh, amended to incorporate that cigarette tax into uh, in, in conference in, in, in this final week. So, but, uh, I mean, I think I would be surprised to see that happen, but it's been kind of a strange session. So I, I guess you, and especially in the legislative process, you shouldn't, you should never count anything out. So, so we'll see. Were that to happen is transportation, the most likely place it could happen as, as you mentioned the house and Senate being so far apart, maybe that's where something more creative would come together. Well, I mean, it, it'd kind of be sort of, you know, I, we, we may be the only state in a nation that would ha be having a, a cigarette tax revenue dedicated to uh, transportation, but, <laughs> but they're so desperate to do something on transportation, you know, that, that might occur. You know, most of the supporters of uh, the people who have really been advocating for a cigarette tax increase have talked about it for two reasons. A, to actually reduce smoking. But B said, you know, a side benefit would be that if you raise, you know, you'd you'd be raising some revenue too. And most people have argued that that revenue should go towards health care. Mm -hmm. But you know, so but you know, there's been talk of a lottery for transportation. So you know, why not a cigarette tax for transportation? Sure, is, is lottery dead for sure, Bobby? Can, can that can that come up in these negotiations? <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, the House passed an amendment to an appropriations bill to the to the. Uh, uh, appropriations bill for the gaming commission saying that uh that uh, no money could be appropriated for the gaming commission until the legislature enacted the lottery so that house did that so it's you know unless that amendment's taken out in conference which you know i assume it will be uh they, they can't you know there can't be a uh Hmm. A, a money for a gaming commission so you know so like the cigarette tax the gaming commission i mean uh the lot like the cigarette tax lottery is 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 at least uh alive technically sure. so, so we'll see i mean it, it, it there'd be a lot of steps to go through to actually pass the lottery but uh there's there seems to be some some want to uh in terms of wanting to pass a lottery by uh, i i would say a majority of the legislature it uh but uh so far the leadership has re has, has resisted that effort yeah well Still lots to follow as the session wraps up. And again, you can follow all of Bobby Harrison's coverage uh, in your daily journal each day or look for it online at djournal.com. And that does it for another episode of Capital View. As always, we thank you for joining us. We remind you, you can catch us each week at djournal.com. This is our normal time slot Monday at 2. We try to hit it uh, when schedules don't allow. Look, uh, we, We'll try to make announcements on our Twitter page. Uh, you can follow that at djournal now and we'll let you know if time changes. So. Again, we thank you for watching, Bobby. Thanks for your time as always, and I uh, hope everyone has a great week. Thanks.